direction. So I was telling him, don't take the easy way out. Take a decision that's going to crush you because in the crushing juice, and it is the juice that gives life. When you see a tired man walking in the heat of the sun, a sip of juice, you see his eyes dilate and rearrange and, and you can see life. Don't love easy ways out. They do not sort out anything. Do you have to drop a demon like a hot iron? Then choose the hard way out. The only time you see rivers meandering around a hill is when they are old and they don't have strength anymore. But when a river is young, they bureau through hills. They cut through, I mean, they make canyons. Steep cliffs on every side because they have the power to break through. So rivers, when they are young, they are narrow, swift, strong. But when they grow old, they spread out. And before you know it, oxbow lakes begin to form. Because every time they meet a little promontory, they can no more do anything about it, so they just cut off. And then if the waters are not enough, a little lake forms on the other side, which was supposed to be part of the river. And in the dry season, they dry up. And the fish and all the animals trapped there die if they can't make the motion from that side of the river to the flowing, vibrant riverside. So on the day we started church, I was just telling my wife for the first time, this is not a decision. We didn't sit down and pray and God said to us, start church. No. I came from a journey and I said to her, we are starting church. She said, when? I said, tomorrow, Sunday. She said, where? I said, in the house. With who? I said, us. And I added to her because I had three staff them, Jerome, Fash, and Joshua. And Fash and Joshua felt that Jerome should come to church. And I said to them, no. I know Jerome's pastor. Jerome is perhaps the only member and two other people who come from time to time. And Jerome was living in their house. The little money we paid Jerome, maybe three or five thousand, it was from there he was paying tithes. That was the only income that the church had. So why do you want to take him away? I had a right to because they were my staff and I was a minister. Could have said the whole office so that we can start well. That's not how we started. Then I started to tell her about the school of Tyrannus. I said to her, Saul of Tarsus, the aim was to propagate the gospel to the whole of Asia. And Paul, like me, thought it would happen in one year. I'm sure Paul was thinking that God would soon release him. So he would set up the best school of ministry. Modeled after the kind that Gamaliel had. But with the improvements based on the revelation knowledge he now had. That was what I thought. I thought God wanted me to come home, repair my home, raise my son. And once I started and he saw my obedience, he would tell me, go to Tokyo. Then I'll have my dream. Go to a modern city. Travel in bullet trains, skyscrapers. Make a name from there. Nigerian pastor rocking Japan. And I'll release a song from there and Sony will just buy the rights. That's my dream. Make money and support the ministry. Liar. Meanwhile, inside the dream of supporting the ministry, Samson, I wanted to own islands. And I'll plant crocodiles around. So that before you can get to the island, I must be the one inviting you. I wanted private helicopters. So when I arrive on the mainland, I enter my private helicopter and fly home. I like my privacy. I wanted armed guards with sophisticated guns. Because I would be wealthy, so wealthy. I felt wealthier than solo. More influential than David. So I needed armed men. 
Abraham had how many? 318 Samson. I wanted to have like 700, 800 armed guys working for me. Every territory towards my house, they are sweeping it every minute to be sure that unless I invite you. I saw my wife painting her nails throughout the day. Do you understand me? She didn't have to do any work. Just paint nails, fix her lipstick, and wipe it. And tell me, honey, do you like this one? I wanted loads of children, maybe like eight. That was my dream. I like a big family. I don't like a small family. This one is just a mistake. Even now, I'm thinking I like, should go to a, an IVF center so that they can take some seeds from me and from her. And then maybe she can have quadruplets at once. Four. And then the second time, three. That's seven. So plus Joel and Sally, nine. Sally rebelled. She said she doesn't know how she will cope because she's always known herself as the last. As for Joel, he thinks that it's not possible. I told him he will see four boys looking more like me than him. So he will know. <laughs> Hallelujah. But that was a dream. At that level, our knowledge of Christianity was that if we made it, the world will bow. That was it. Keith Green died in a plane crash. I mean... He drove a whole denomination of Pentecostalism, of the word of God. Because of his rabid love for Jesus. And he was just a super generous giver. Great musician. There is a redeemer. Jesus, God's own son. Precious Lamb of God, Messiah, holy. That was one of his songs. He made millions when musicians had not even thought of starting a ministry. And he would give away his millions every year. And God just kept blessing him. He died and left his money to some of the biggest ministries that you know on planet Earth. And they are sustained by that money. The money was so much Zainab, they invested it. And it is the proceeds that are keeping things going. And his wife, have, uh, his wife has kept true to the covenant. So that was my dream. In part, I didn't think I was qualified to stand at the head of an army because of my antecedents. You know, very soon, people can accuse you to the point that you yourself will believe what they said, isn't it? Yeah. Me and my wife can't even tell you what caused us to break. We don't remember the last quarrel. Sometimes I sit down and I'm trying to think, what happened? Because the way I loved her, Jesus. I was a Christian. But I was still Babylonish in my language. So Christians didn't used to call their girls babes. Kengani? Call my wife baby. Some of my friends still call her baby Annie. They will call it the way I call it before. I was purely on the spirit path. But what happened was... I had believed that I was irredeemable. I was beyond redemption. So the fact that I received Jesus was just the starting point for me to go into penance. I will live the remainder of my life. You know? Celebrate of sin. Just to pay back. Which was wrong theology. So Jesus had mercy on me. Allowed different kinds of things to happen to me so that my eyes will open beyond the vista that I had seen. And every meeting you go to, you know, Christians find it easier to introduce you as uh, praise God. You know, God is really moving in our days. There's revival. How many of you know and believe there's revival in the land? If you are not sure tonight, 
in our midst, one of the biggest sinners and rascals in this area. You know, he's born again and he's saved. I remember how I was introduced in Burma just by one Sunday. The person was going to become my pastor later. By that time, he was an evangelist. And I walked into the meeting with my band, my friends, and they introduced me to one of the worst sinners, rascals, terror. And today he's born again. You know, he was my senior. <laughs> and he said to me, uh, excuse me, sir, can you humbly come to the stage? So it took humility for me to get up on stage. I went up on stage and they said to me that I should sing a song. Oh, which song will I sing? I said, swing low. <laughs> Sweet chariot. And Christians, oh, ba, 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 ba. So I was wondering. That's not a Christian song. And they said, I can sing another one. I said, knock, knock, knocking on heaven. Hey, la, ba, ba, ya, ga, ba, sa. No. Is somebody smoking Igbo? And the smoke has covered you and you are charged. And you are entering over those zones. And then you are thinking, I'm about to die. You are actually about to die. You are knocking on heaven's door. It's the pun and the irony of a lot of music. The music has undertones. That's the problem with secularization. The secular world has undertones. Suggestive. Come on, come on, hit me with your uh, uh. Okay, what is uh, uh? They now leave you to. And then when you hear it, you'll be telling your mom, mommy, but there's nothing wrong with it now. They didn't even say anything. They just said, hit me with your uh. I mean, uh, uh. I don't know why, mommy, you took the para for personal bag. It's the suggestiveness. That's how Satan rules. He fertilizes your system. And then he moves back and leaves you in the world of suggestiveness. I could never have navigated to produce the kind of gospel music that God birthed through us because we pioneered it. I'm not confused. Recently, someone sent me a text. It was my wife. I read the text and she was talking about how God has used you so I, I called her a few days after. I was embarrassed because we're normally not very kind to each other like that. We're, we were both young, Samson, so we can fight over everything and nobody will back down. And then we'll come back and say sorry and be kissing like birds. So she said she sent it to me. Then I said, did you copy it from somebody's page? Because the person that wrote it, wrote it from the outside, looking inside, dispassionately. No effort to massage my ego or anything. She said, no, I wrote it. I didn't believe her. I kept scouring Facebook, hoping that I would see who wrote that thing that she copied. Because she was telling me of ground that you pioneered in the preaching of the gospel, using the instrumentality of music. She was sharing revelations that it was you that brought to light. And the church is using them now. Only one person has ever said that. When Nathaniel came for our 60th birthday, he was standing and saying, you know, before anybody said Yahweh, before anybody thought, before, I mean, you've broken grounds on every direction. And I called him later. I said, Nat, stop that. I don't like people talking about me. Because really, I didn't do anything. What happened, Sheps, to me, was that I found out that most of the things we were advancing as gospel were too shallow for the king. If I could get up on the night I was just getting born again, for, for instance, you're asking me to sing, and I'm singing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and you are excited. 
And you are doing she ba 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 ba. Can't the Holy Ghost tell you that's not a spirit song? I know. I entered a church on Sunday. And the Lord had given me the order to bless them. Well, I didn't have any original word to give them. He just said, go and bless Samson's house. I'm using Samson as an example. And I entered the church and I looked at the pastor and his wife. And the Lord said, do you remember the first day you met them? And I remembered. Like yesterday. I walked into a church in Mandu. I told them I was coming. And they thought I wouldn't come because they met me in household where Yinka Yusuf is. Or used to be. And I said to the pastor, I'll come to your church. Because I liked the flavor of the choir. They were young, youthful. And they thought I wouldn't come. So I strolled in. And it was a house. The parlor was a small parlor. Built funnily like a house, a house. You know? And so some of the singers were on top of a platform. On top of uh, is a daze. But it was built with clay. So they were standing up. They are standing on the stairs. Standing on the floor. And they, they were singing. Send down the spirit of love. Send down the spirit from above. Let your power flow on each and every one. Let your spirit come, confirming my every word, so we might know that you are here. So we might know that you are real. The hair on my nape stood up. Goosebumps broke out of my shoulders. I can tell you that every orifice on my skin opened up. I was so moved in the spirit. I said to God, little ah, children like this, where do they know to sing this kind of songs? I said, if you help me and I can write like this, you will hear me. It was like an angel. Walk past and slap me and say, Come on, stop that. I said, What do you mean? He said, It's your song. I didn't recognize it. But that song at that time was that revolutionary. When I stand up in any assembly and the Lord says, Sing it, I know there's wahala. The moment I start is trouble. The pastors will change their message. People, we've seen pastors give their life to Christ. <laughs> so what was amazing me was how they carried it it's one thing to create a masquerade you know the mask right but another thing to carry it in the power and I noted the boys and the bishop was one of them I noted them all of them a couple of them are pastors in different places. That's how we began our relationship. So I heard his choir sing. Do you remember the song? Something Adonai. What's, what's the song? <laughs> From the rise, rising of the sun. Yes. Mm-hmm. It was the kind, that was the kind of flavor they had in that church. In Mandu, in the midst of Muslims, there was not a church there. Oh, Omorayewa was down, down, down this way near the National Eye Hospital, which was in construction. And they were boys. <laughs> and their wives were young girls. So I thought, what courage. 
These were the kind of songs they sang, spirit songs. You know, when you hear the song, you know, this is not one carefully written song. This is a birthing of the spirit. What's the chorus again, Victor? Uh -huh. What emotions doesn't this evoke? You want to cry? You want to be happy? You want to rest? You want to get up and fight? Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you are just, it just, it alters, it takes away the flesh and just elevates the spirit. Just the sound of it. So I shared with them, and I told them, this is where your ministry started from. And I told them all the stations that I had met the church in and how I came there that day. So I felt, okay, now I can bless. Now I can bless. But that's, that's how we started this thing that you are seeing now. We called it School of Tyrannos Antigrace for months. And like I told you, for eight straight months, Lala, every day from 4 till 10.30 to 11, that little office, a station roundabout. You people used to meet at uh, stadium roundabout, isn't it? Yeah. So anytime I went to visit their own assembly, they would be by the stadium. We were at station. But I went there to, I went there to claim her. Because <laughs> the moment I got her, I, we, we hung out and that was all. I didn't know we were preparing for our meeting now. That's how God does things. It's the school of the spirit. So we called ourselves the school of Tyrannos. We called ourselves the school of the spirit. We called ourselves the New Deal Assembly, NDA. Because we said we're in Kaduna. So NDA is even good, an acronym. And recently I passed by in Sabo. And I saw a church, NDA. I started laughing. New deal. We we're talking about the new deal that we had in God. That God did with Abraham. Then when he began to change all the theology. I mean he began to revisit every verse of scripture. And bring new light. We called it redefinitions. Because we realized what he was doing was redefining our knowledge of the word. It was the school of tyranny. I didn't come here to build anything. I looked out at this place today and I told my people in the office, I said, I will never, the way you knew me, did you ever hear me talk about a structure to even think this big? No, never. I never saw it. I didn't smell it. If you showed me, I will shut it down because I reject it. I was not the kind that you could give a prophecy to and I would just embrace it. I knew God so accurately and I strove to know him more accurately. Then I, if I tell you the Lord has come in now, you will know it. His government will enter. I don't do PV. <sighs> it's the Lord. No. That's PV. It used to annoy me when I get into services. I see people doing gimmicks. Because the Lord is so easy. He's available. He just wants to stroll with you. And if he enters a place with you, it will be evident. It's not your presence that is calming the wind. It is his presence. He rides mountains. He rides mountains. Within two years, they didn't say Paul taught them for two years. Do you understand me? They said in the space of two years, the whole of Asia had heard the gospel. How long were they in the school, Sarah? I don't know. But I know because I can see Josephine. I remember when I met her. I walked up to her like you walk to a girl. I said, the Lord said you should be my friend. Would you be my friend? And she looked at me like, are you toasting me? I said, eh, no. Huh? <laughs> I started to laugh. 
I was a talking girlfriend, boyfriend. But it was okay for me. Because of where she was and where I was. And we have traveled all this length of time together. Every material I had read, she had to read it. Record time. You must not take a book out of my office. Read it there. Where you stop. When you come tomorrow, continue. Because the only thing I guarded was my books, my tapes. We inherited it from Oedeku. They buy the truth and sell it not. <laughs> it's not my fault that you didn't buy your own truth. I bought my truth. <laughs> so if you read it, even if it's a cassette, you listen to it and stop it there. One day my friend came and said, who moved the cassette forward? I said, excuse me, it's my cassette. So we invested. I don't know. I don't respect anybody until I've seen your kingdom investment portfolio. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many Bibles do you have on your, di on your shelf? Even my wife cannot enter the study. And my children, they all know. That's the holiest of all. When I sit on my chair, they say he's on his stinking chair. Leave him alone. If you don't think, you will stink. We heard it over and over and over again. So she's here. If she wants to see my red eye, let her try to take a book. Come! If you hear me shouting, you think I gave birth to her grandfather. She's here. Ash was not in the picture then. They were only in the choir. <laughs> but I knew that we had to raise. It's the legs I always look at. You remember those your black shoes? I don't want to describe them. <laughs> she had a long skirt. She will close from Tricania and run to that junction there. I tell her where I kept the key. She will open the door and then sit down there and read by the light of the security lamp when she has read. And she must not be slow. It was two of them like that. Rose Otoikila. I was married. So when I said to her, I like you, and I like to be your friend, God told me to come and befriend you. She looked at me like, eh? And I said, no, I want you to be my real friend, real friend. God told me to befriend you. She said, okay, if it is the Lord. <laughs> and he was. Recently she wrote me and Reminded me the journey so far, you know, and how far we have come. But because she was married, sorry, because, because she was married, we didn't get to achieve the kind of speed I and Josu did, and I and Sheps. No. No, it was stupendous speed. <laughs> By the time you met me, I was a pastor. You know, that would drilled you. With everything you brought from Latari. Because it was always, Sarah, about what? Imprinting and letting the people run. Leaving an imprint and letting the people run with the vision. You remember the book? Run with the Vision by Lester Sumrall. Recently, I, I told Stephen and his wife, you know, Jessica, I said, ah, how, how do I get e-books? And then they went and did the research, and Jessica sent me about eight e-books of Lester Sumrall. And now I have them on my system, so I can, I can read, run with the vision as many times as I want, passing the baton, uh, you know, uh, sword to conquer, right? Huh? Uh, courage to conquer. Uh, yeah, testing them. <laughs> they can't forget. These books were Jesus. When we did the Believer's Authority, Mommy Jordan finished it, I think maybe 15 or 20 times, and she translated it to Hausa. Because <laughs> I told them, I said, we need to translate these materials to Hausa. She translated the Believer's Authority. 
Amazing translation. And you know, that was the first book when Matt Bima came to start Rema and they wanted to do house our work. That's the first book they translated. And I told him about it. Okay. So it was all about what? The school of Tyrannus. It's a school where every sheet of paper gets the same print, the same print, the same print, the same print. By the time all of you came, I couldn't fight you. Come to my office so that you don't misunderstand it. I've not seen you, so you don't feel upset. Some people feel upset when you say, I don't see you, you don't come, how am I going to help? But that's the only way. She did that for years. And one day, she said, fash. I said, which fash? Come on. <laughs> We're talking something, you're talking fash. <laughs> Joy, Victor's wife. Joy Damisa. She would close from anywhere and begin to head off for her grandpa, man, slapping. She used to walk very fast. And the road was rough. So me, I take my time so that I don't stumble and fall. And you know, guy man, no, they change. She's very swift. Market woman. There's nothing that girl cannot sell. She can sell you Pepsi with Coke cover. They will buy it. I'm telling you. Sold everything. Even Dadik that thinks he's a marketer. Or like Dadik, no rich joy. Joy can sell anything. And I've never seen somebody more astute and, and conscientious with her business, Sarah. She will start with 5,000 and you can you will see the growth of it like that, like that. But she loved the spirit. So you can gladly, you can pour hours. And one day she came and said to me, I met one tall boy in the bus. I said, tall. How tall? She said, this is how he sat down on his knees were like this at the back. They sat together. And then he introduced himself and asked her her name. I said, what did you do? She said, I told him. I said, why? She said, he was scaring me. Yeah. The way he was asking her, and he put her by the window. So there's no escape. She had to tell him her names and everything. And then when she said she's dropping here, he too dropped. So from there, she decided she's coming to Anguan Pama to come and report. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, because we would do that. And my wife, my wife would come. When people came that time, she said, I know you who you came for. Go, go. He's inside. And she'll go away and do her work. Many of times she'll bring her work home. They were not only young people. They were old people as well. But that was the school of Tyrannus. It was opening. I knew what it was. But I never thought it would metamorphose into something like this. My only joy right now is that this has given us ample space. So people like Jerry can walk in here. And within a week, when he's leaving here, I know what will happen. I've not even spoken to him yet. <laughs> but everybody has spoken to him. Rabi, uh, Dogo, uh, Fash. I don't even know the number of people. He was telling me the people that have spoken to him. And I was excited. We have always envisaged a center where you will enter and crash with Jesus and never be the same again. Irreparable damage. That's what the school of Tyrannus is about. One prayer I always pray, and I will initiate it into your life today, is that I don't have to meet people twice. I've never. There's no assembly I have stood in, and then I have to come back before they say, Kai, we like that man's ministry. Or, no, no, no. I always minister like this, the last. So people who hear me think I don't teach faith, because I will say things like, in case I die after this service, this is the most important message I have ever preached, and I'm going to preach it today. So people will hear me and think, he's prophesying his death. 
Do I look like I don't like life? I love life. Oh. But lie. Zainab, honestly, I love life. And I don't mean enjoyment. Oh. I mean living. Even when I'm in the shower, I bring out my head to breathe. Because I'm scared that I will choke inside the shower. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why I don't swim. It's just, I don't understand how I can enter water and sit down there for two minutes. For what? No, 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 no. Come out and breathe. That's my, I, look, I love life. I'm, I'm, I'm fearful. <laughs> I'm not courageous. Anything that threatens life, eh, bam, 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 you leave it there. Yeah. I'm not like you. I was tough, but I was a sissy inside. It's a lie. It's just a veneer, a shade. A shade. You know. So I would say things like that, and people would take it for granted. And I was speaking my most current, full revelation of Christ. And I meant it. That if you hear me today, and, I, and you hear that I died on my way home, take this message, run with it. You can never miss it. You'll walk in the same footsteps, but a thousand times more, and ten thousand times more powerfully. Till today, that's what I do. I'm about to preach a message about the days of Noah. I preached it to my wife first, in bed. It was, an, it was a spiritual experience, just a few weeks ago. I just woke her and I said to her, hear what the Lord is telling me about the end times. <laughs> the experience that happened to us in bed, do you understand me? <laughs> then she began to say so if that's the case then then if that's the case then then the scriptures began to and that was all I wanted to see that I give you a key that when you put in the latch not only one door opens windows open another door parts there you know chain reactions of openings that's what happens for me it's the easiest way to teach when the Holy Ghost is the one orchestrating it. When would I have time to meet Becky twice? For what? In the little time they have been with me, I said to them, one day, I said to them, you are going to help me with pastor's kids. The forum. And they would have been shocked. Because they didn't even know I knew their names. The husband just told me now, He's got a job. He's in my degree. She had told me a few months ago. So some of you, I don't even have four weeks with you. Do you understand me? And I don't know. The Holy Ghost doesn't put a sign. Geoffrey is going to be here for six months. So make a scheduled program for six months for him. No. I, I just decided, Sarah, Kisan and that is by the river, that one that is like a blade, razor blade, that flat one, if it touches you, it just peels your skin. Yeah, that's how I wanted to be. And when you meet me, you just leave bleeding straight. You know surgical blades, if they touch you, they can't take them off. Your skin is already parted. I wanted to be sharper than that. I tell the Lord, preachers preach one message and a man's life is changed forever. You know, Jack Hayford just died a few days ago. And I had Francis Chan giving his testimony. Fran Chan built a church of almost 3,000 members in California. His wife was a beauty queen from Asia. And one day he got up and came to church. Church was thriving. Millions coming in, in dollars. And he told them the Lord said he should give over the church and move on. So he called one of the pastors and he said the Lord said he should hand it over to him. Handed over everything. And he and his wife left. Everything, Samson. Don't pay me a salary. Don't do my rent. Nothing. Our assignment here is done. People were crying. Chan left. But he belonged to a stream that was dangerously in error. It was run by a pastor Smith. 
who started a, a wave, you know, holiness movement and all of that. You know. But Francis Chan was there, yeah. So God wanted to correct his doctrine and philosophy and everything. So God was initiating a journey in his life. Now Francis Chan wrote a book, one book, and the book sold millions instantly. Bestseller on the New York Times, bestseller on the Los Angeles Times, bestseller East West Coast. Millions run into the ministry. Francis Chan is so rich that just like um, Keith Green, Francis Chan is just a foundation. Several ministries complete, correct, collect their yearly budget check from his foundation, just from writing. If you watch social media, you see the Verge Network. He is the one that pioneers it for discipleship and for training. Resources for young pastors. You can go to the network and collect stuff. And then Francis Chan, because of the denomination he was in, they were abusing every Pentecostal. They thought that Pentecostals don't read the Bible. Pentecostals are just grace, 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 until he ran into Jack Hayford. And he said, Jack Hayford taught about grace. And then he got close to the man and found the man the way he walks in love towards those who criticize him the most. And Francis Chan said his life was never the same again. Then Francis Chan began to go out with Pentecostals, hang out with them, until his denomination ostracized him. But for his money, they would have killed him. Jack Hayford was the one who sang the song, Majesty, worship his majesty. He was a songwriter as well, as a teacher of the word of God. He was president of life, University, a theological seminary in the LA area. He was president of the Assemblies of God. No, Foursquare, four Foursquare, the church by Amy Simple McPherson. He was her president for three or four tenures. I remember what drew me to California. I didn't like California necessarily. Jerry left. Pastor Jerry left and said he felt God was calling him to California. I said, okay, go. If you don't find him there, keep on moving. There are 50 states. And he got there. And in one of those churches, Shiloh Bible Church in Oakland, he was telling me the stories. And he said he met this old woman. And she was uh, Amy Simple McPherson's uh, protege. I said, Amy? He said, yes. I said, what's her name? He said, Violet Kitely. I said, what's the name of the church? He said, Shiloh Bible Church. And I said, what happened? He said, she told him how the Lord told her um, that they should come and plant a Bible school in the north of Nigeria. But she had never really found anybody. <laughs> how old is she? He said she was in her mid-80s. No, late 80s then. But she died at 92, I think. Then he said, Jack, Jack Hayford was passing through the area. I said, which Jack? <laughs> I said, so what did you do? Did you follow him? No. He said, no, they greeted that he ministered and Jack. <laughs> I said, where did you say this, this place is? He told me, Oakland. That's how I bought my ticket. Next time you are there, you know. And I went there. And our first meeting with Violet Kitely, as I saw her just in the car park, just a small woman like that, I just knelt down. And she lifted up her eyes when she reached me. And she said, what's your name? I said, Chris. My name is Chris. I'm from Kaduna in northern Nigeria. And she shook my hand. Welcome to Shiloh Bible Church. You're going to preach tonight. <laughs> I said, me, I will not preach tonight. I'll punish the devil. You know the kind of woman she is, Sarah? When you finish preaching, she's like you. You just tell the person, that message is a good message, but it's not the message for us. 
give him his master. That's how she does. On her pulpit, very blunt. And I'm talking of who is who. There's nobody that has preached the gospel in the past hundred years that didn't have to go to Oakland. I said to her, my pastor is Lester Sumrall. I said, I know Frank. I was at his funeral. When Gordon Linton's wife stood up and said, your lies, Frank, Lester, Sumrall, a man of faith. If it's in the word, he'll believe it. If it's not, he'll fight you with his life. <laughs> the only thing that makes her come alive is if you ask her a spiritual question. But other than that, hmm? She doesn't watch football, doesn't watch movies, doesn't know anything other than the spirit. Those are the kind of women I want here that can clean a whole region. Amy Simple sat down in Los Angeles and uh, what's the gambling place? Las Vegas. And she gave her the north. She said, go and take the north of California. And you know the girl cleaned it when she died. Whole dynasties of mayors. Do you understand me? Families of mayors, leaders of the black congressional caucus. You know, whole families came and stood to celebrate their mother. I too came from Africa. <laughs> My mother. <laughs> you know, and she left me a gift. You know. At least I'm not an orphan. God allowed me to meet some of the patriarchs. I'm matriarchs. That's how you have to treat this, uh, the gospel blessing. You must treat it like that, profoundly. You must know when you have touched a touchstone. There's transference of apostolic governing authority. So I stood up on stage to marry that day. And I sang two songs when I came down. I just said a few things in prayer and I came down. And I knew that she knew that I was dodging. Well, what am I going to preach? Oh. Turn on faces. No, no, no. Turn and face this way. And this is how she stood by her son. Immediately she stood up and she stood her son, Pastor David. He was 63 then. Her son had pastored. Her grandson had pastored the same church. Then she said to him, pray for him. And she put her hand on his back. This guy began to describe quarrels we were having in my bedroom with my wife. <laughs> and he was telling me the kind of spirit when I return home, I will meet. Began to prophesy about my son and my daughter and the work that lay ahead. He kept saying the work, the work, and I... Sit down, sir. Those operations of the spirit. Her hand is smaller than Akara. Samson. She just put it on her son's back and he was prophesying. She didn't say anything. You know, in our own case, we'll be saying it, then the person will be amplifying. No, she just put her hand there, like transmitter. Moves of the spirit. And then when he finished the prophecy, she knew. And she withdrew her hand and then she went and took the microphone and said, God has visited Shiloh Bible Church today and we give thanks to his name. Now, God bless you. Keep on praising him. We'll see you again. No drama. One day, you guys may travel to Oakland, in California, go to Shiloh Bible Church. But you can even go online tonight and get Violet Kitely. Violet Kitely. K-I-T-E-L-Y. You can see her funeral. You may even see me there. So at least that will add to your resume. Say, I'm a pastor of Indidia now. <laughs> Shina, the last time I met her alive, when we met, I didn't know she was 91, turning 92. 
I didn't know she couldn't walk. She was already sick. She couldn't walk. So they were wheeling her into church with a wheelchair. Now, normally the pastors sit on this side. So I already got them to make me sit there because I knew if I sit in that side, if I sat in that side, there's no how she would say a word to me. They said she doesn't talk. She doesn't see people. I said, it's all right. So the Nigerian pastors told them, you know, it's her son, her African son. So, To my horror, Victor, the door on that side opened and they wheeled her to that side and she sat there throughout service. I was sitting down telling the Lord. Even I traveled. I was asking him, do you know how much? Just from New York to here, do you know how much? I was telling the Lord. No one day I was praying and I told Jesus, God bless you. <laughs> so I just stopped and asked myself, what did I say? God bless you, Lord. <laughs> you get it? I was asking you, I hope you know how much. And the Lord just kept quiet. So me too, I've learned that when he's quiet, it doesn't mean he's not answering you. It doesn't mean he's stupid. In fact, he's telling you, you talk too much. Concentrate. So I managed to concentrate on a little bit of the service. And after the service, I was already saying, I will stand up, whoop, and I will run. But it was wider than this. The church is wider. And I was thinking, by the time I get there, the staff, personal staff, would have created a cordon. How do I break through? After service, I was still sitting down, looking and thinking, run or do not to run. Then they were trying to wheel her out, and she stopped them and said they should take her back to the office that way. They started wheeling her to me. I just knelt down there and I waited, and she said, Chris. She didn't speak. She blessed me. And her hands are like just a quarter of my hand. Small woman. Like Akara. If she touches you, you think it's a feather. Everything I've said to you now is the school of Tyrannus. It's opening up the spirit to you. Those are the kind of things Paul shared with them. Do you get what I'm saying? He majored on the word of God, the experience of it, the interactions with it, and the impeccable records. That's what he was boasting about when he said, henceforth let no man trouble me, bear upon me the marks. He was talking about the marks of the gospel. What have you done with the gospel? What have you given? I told Jerry, any time you hear that thing, Jack, Spirit-filled Bible. Do you understand me? Those are the people that compiled it. Spirit Life Bible. <laughs> I said, go and collect everything you can collect and run. It's a privilege God is giving you. So that's what this center was supposed to become. And that's what it is. That's why our greatest assets are the pupils. I didn't say people. What did I say? Pupils, like primary school pupils. This is center of studies. Advanced studies, preliminary, advanced, and, you know, postgraduate studies. Because that's how the spirit is taught. You can't teach him by precepts. You have to teach him by precepts and by experience. It was when I was listening to Madame Icha when she was talking at my... Was it my birthday or what day was that? When you people were giving testimonials. It was when she was talking that I remembered some things she said. Mm. That day, one of the most profound things that would happen was when I announced I would be going to Ghana. <laughs> Just Ghana. 
I am going to Ghana. Who invited you? My wife said, I said, I saw the Ghanaian man. He was wearing kente wrapper. He said, come, come. Strike while the iron is hot. The gates to the city are open. She said, okay. Is Ghana a city? It's just my candid advice. I said, it's true. Ghana is not a city. She said, because if you go, where will you find him? Did he tell you his name? I said, no. And I went back to God. He didn't answer me. So I went and read the Macedonian story. This is where I was reading. Him. When I, the Bible fell on my chest and I slept off. And I slept thinking, Lord, is this kind of experience, is it finished? Doesn't it happen in our time? Paul said he saw a Macedonian. That's how the gospel reached Europe. Hey, show me where the gospel will go to next. At that time, I was already singing in tongues. I'm starting from my home, among my people and in my country, until I reach the ends of the earth. So I had done Kaduna, Zaria, Joss, Kaduna, Zaria, Joss, Kaduna, Zaria, Joss. Then I added Bauchi, then Kano, then Kaduna, Zaria, Joss, Bauchi, Kano, Kaduna, Zaria, Joss. That's how I was always moving in circles. Abuja was one of the, it was difficult for me to go to Abuja even. I didn't ever think God wanted me in Abuja yet. But then finally I entered Abuja. And there's hardly any church in Abuja that were not in the foundation. There's hardly any. And I'm not saying it with boasting. You know. And I will come back and wait. Because I was determined that this thing can be done systematically, properly, cutting edge. We want to initiate you into a new realm of understanding of the word of God, Shina. We want to initiate you. So that when you carry the word of God, you will not start, you know, some people come here saying, you know me, I only like science. I like chemistry and physics and mathematics. I don't like reading. That's my problem. That problem dies. Amen. No, I mean, the moment you meet us, yes. when you utter it, that's the last time they ever say it again. They come back after 18 books. I mean, my own books, so, apart from the Bible. When I tell you that Kenneth Hagin read the New Testament 150 times every year, the New Testament, minimum. He said he prayed the Ephesian prayer. We prayed it today and yesterday with my family that the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. No, you receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. In the Lord. Look, he, he said he would pray that prayer by his pulpit every day more than 100 times. He'd be reading it, reading it. Reading it, reading it. No members were coming. One year, two years, nobody, nobody. Then he would read the second prayer. Then go to Colossians and read the Colossian prayers. He's reading them at the pulpit. Just reading them at the pulpit. Reading them. Maria Woodward Etta. Her hands were smaller than Violet Kaitley's. But the moment she lifts up her hands and says, let us bless the Lord. You just hear people screaming, shouting, everywhere, just lifting up her hands. So people went to her services and waited for the hands to lift. But you see, that was that's the sprinklings of Messiah's glory. Yeah. He doesn't want you in that realm. He wants where he will dwell in you. So you walk into a place and his shadow falls. That's what David carried. And you know, David gave it to his son Solomon. Comes with that. When Solomon stood up on the day of the dedication of the temple, David was not physically there. But the spirit was there. David was there. Immediately they began to sing. They said, and they lifted up their voices to sing. And the trumpeters blew. And then the voices of the singers and the voices of the trumpeters and the voices of the flute, flutists, all of them became like one voice that the Spirit of the Lord came and every man fell flat. They were slain in the Spirit. Solo could not manufacture that. It was God attesting to David, his servant. 
That's my dream. And when you get up, it will be known you have a father. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that you yourself cannot uh, break the realm of the spirit. But you don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have done it to a measure. Two whole years. And the whole of Asia heard the gospel. That dimension of the gospel. I watch some of you lead worship. I watch it online. Especially after your meetings. And I say, no, no, no. Something is not right. It's like you go there unprepared. Like you don't know what you are carrying. You walk in there and you are expecting that I will worship for 40 minutes before the presence of God comes. No! It's not the house. I see your struggles. It hurts me. <laughs> so today I'm telling you the story. We are that generation that doesn't struggle. Not for his presence. We stand up and we know it is the Lord standing. Oh, that's all. Know it from today. I said know it and you are sitting down looking at me. I'm not saying you should stand up. But show a sign that you intercepted something. You get up on your feet. Collect it. Do some gesture. Do you understand me? Sit down. Sit down. It's the lack of interception that is a problem for me. Know it that when you stand up, it's the Lord, not you. Where is he going to? No other righteous home better than you. He has called you his own. I have a father. He calls me his own. Before even time began, my life was in his hands. So just know it. I'm the temple of the living God. He has no other place to go to. If they need to know him, they must meet me. It's an audacity with which you approach the word. Your time of intercourse with him. Don't wait for anybody to pat you on the back. I have friends who will tell you, Oh, DV, you pray too much, you study too much, you do this too much. It's a lie. Don't let it penetrate your skin. Your fellowship with him, that's what it is. Your interaction with him. Tell him, I know you. I know you have nowhere else to go. I'm your hiding place. Isaiah prophesied that in the last days a man will become a hiding place. So I'm your hiding place. Arise you on the ark of your strength and enter. Enter into your rest. You are talking to him. It's not a tent anymore. It's me. So when you approach a door, you don't Go with your hand to open the handle. It parts. There's no door that can shut down on you. For what? You turn and ask heaven. Your son is here. Where are you? I'm not the kind that will go and sit down and then be negotiating with a doctor for my health. Where are you? When heaven is quiet, doesn't mean you are wrong. You need to master that and know it. This is the last time I will have to sing two songs before you show up. It's the last time I'm going to pray for 10 minutes before you show up. It's the last time. My silence invokes your presence. My silence.
just as your silence is confirmation to me that you are still speaking because night after night declares your glory. Even the darkness is speech unto the learned and the wise. You are my maker. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, perfected, polished, checked by quality control, and released. You are my release. Don't let me waste your time if I'm not it. Pull me back, take me home. Hide me in your pavilion. I'm contented to rest where you are. But if I have work to do, then let's do it. Just like one word from you can change a man's life drastically, so also with me. Today I declare I have no prayer request. I have nothing to ask you. You have done all things well. Me. Thank you for the children you gave me. Thank you for the problems they give me. Thank you for the successes they bring. They are all adding up to make you a better, make me a better man of God. I'm responsible for them. When I come to you, you can freely ask me, where are they? Give an account and I will give you. I will give you. I'm responsible for my church. Responsible for my pastor. So I pray for them. I pray for him. When I meet you, you can ask me, what happened to your pastor? I declare to you, oh God, this is my watch. I'm the watchman in charge of this watch. And when I finish with my field, I begin to take other people. There are other ministries in our church. I'm responsible for them. I'm responsible for Samson and Naomi. I'm responsible for Victor and Joy. I'm responsible. You call them by name. Why are you pretending that if they fall, it doesn't affect you? If they stand, it doesn't affect you. I'm responsible for Denham and Godia. I'm just waiting for hands to be laid on you so you'll be declared a pastor. For what? Empty head. Those who wait, don't wait like that. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls And he hears me when I call Listen to me. I saw a picture. The picture I saw, very simple. The Lord was describing to me the call. Because we are writing that book now. And I just saw a man who heard God call his name. And he began to crouch and began to bend until he decreased and bowed his head to the ground and was praying. As he bowed himself, it was like he was trying to make himself as tiny as possible. Then another thing I saw, Jose, was a mystery. I saw God rising out of that crouched man. The man was like looking for the ground to enter into and disappear. But as he was pressing down to become insignificant, God was just explosively rising. Then the Lord said to me, that's the call. When man decreases, I increase. I fill up the entire earth and heavens. That's the call. It's not anything. Stop disturbing lawyers to register something. Stop disturbing people to follow them. It's a fake following. Decrease. Decrease enough 
until you touch him. Then he will begin to rise. When God arises, that's what's called ministry. Have you diminished enough for him to arise? Have you provoked him? It's not rocket science. It's not the gift. Stop magnifying the charismatic gifts. Not the gift. Fred, that's what it is. You hear me? If your father fails to do it, do it. Decrease. Till you become the smallest you can become. And wait. Wait for him to receive you. Wait for him to affirm to you that you have found the right way. Then he will begin to rise. You may not be permitted to see him rising, but you hear men screaming the results of his rising. Because when he rises, his enemies, they are scattered, shattered. Chains are broken. Freedom is the sound you hear. Rainfall. He births in you a hunger for him. My God. Nothing can give you that. Laying on her hands cannot give you that hunger. When you say, I need you, dummy, the need sounds like a bottomless pit. You yourself know you are touching it. It's an anointed needing. That's what the world is waiting for. The manifestation of the sons of God. All of you that go into the city from today, when you enter, carry that indelible presence of God. Don't study for it. Acknowledge it. Believe it. And repeat it to your spirit, soul, and body until in those realms you agree. Then you will see it. Studying can't give that to you. Listening to other people's teachings can't give that to you. They are okay. You are doing that just to keep your heart in the atmosphere of the spirit. To this kind of endeavor and pursuit, nobody has an advantage over another. Nobody. The number of years you've been around do not give you any access. Your education, the color of your skin, your height, they don't give you any access. How holy your family was doesn't give you any edge. This is where you know how fair God is. But when you get up from the ground, you declare to him, you are the father of all, fair to all, just in every age. I worship you. worship you. Learn the songs that are sung without music. As your ears are tuned to heaven. Your mouth is singing on the earth. Heavenly tunes. I open that to you. And when I say singing, I'm not talking of Dore Mi Fa so. I'm talking of every message you utter. At this point, you will not be struggling to teach your children. Because many of the times, familiarity is what limits them. But impartations of the spirit will happen. You'll just look at Punan, you say it has started. Because you can see it. It's a whirlwind. You'll just look at Nansat, you say, yeah, 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 yeah. You'll look at Nicole, you'll know, be patient. It's not rocket science. Everything that you cannot do naturally, you will know that that's what he has called you to. Your limits and limitations will be your beckoning call. And you will step into them. Oh my God! I wish you can hear what I'm saying. 
I'm blessing you like you are not, you are not the only ones here. I'm desiring that this pathway be reprinted, re, re, re-engraved. That's the school, school of Tyrannos. I charge you to go and open other schools when he calls you to, in your schools. The worst cases of addictions, when you meet them, that's how they go. Every prison door opens at your approach. No, I'm not wishing it over you. I don't know if you are saying amen for the right reason. I'm telling you to see it. I'm not wishing that it happens to you. One of the prophecies about Messiah is that his voice will not be heard in the market. They didn't mean that he won't be arguing, Sarah. What they mean is not by labor. That if I come to your house every day, they say, ah, turn on, she's praying again. No, that's not it. That's not it. How many prayers does Nicole have to make before you prepare breakfast for her? While she's sleeping, you are fixing it. This is accurate knowledge. I'm saying your days of labor are over. Because they don't impress him. They don't. Knowledge is what moves heaven and earth. Do you understand that? I said, do you understand that? You are limited with eyesight. Blind people will be getting healed in your meeting. Like water. In spite of your own limitations. And it will not be because of any effort. You are bold. You'll be laying hands on bald heads and they will become afros. No, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm just giving you an illustration so you understand. You'll be saying I'm inadequate. But everybody, heaven and earth, will be saying that you are the all-purpose tool for this assignment. Perfectly suited for it. Dummy. Nobody will ever hear the sound of your voice and wait for some process of time. There's no such thing in the realm of the spirit. There's no process. Did you hear what the Bible said when Peter got into Cornelius' house? He asked Cornelius, what did you send me for? I mean, who sent for me? Why did you send for me? And Cornelius said, well, I was in the place of prayer. I saw a man standing at my right hand. And the man said, I should send to Joppa that by the sea in the house of one Simon, the tanner of leather, there's another Simon whose surname is Peter. That I should send for you to tell me the things I need to know. So he wasn't asking for anything. The Lord was telling him, on account of you, I want to open up a new door to the Gentile world. He didn't know what the Lord wanted to do. Peter will tell him. And Peter began to say, now I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, in every vocation, whoever calls upon him, he will come to him. Peter was still saying that when the Holy Spirit fell. Why do you have to stand up for 30 minutes? Why do you have to speak for one hour? For the Holy Spirit to fall. See, I reject it. In fact, if for anything, it should be easier in my day than in Peter's day. Peter didn't preach anything. He was just beginning to say, now I understand, though, that God is no respecter of persons. Anybody, so you a Gentile, God sent his angel to you. That's how the Gentiles entered the commonwealth of Israel. You too, when you get up, I say, God has got no. Do you understand that? Yes. Do it fully. Lift up your hands like you are, someone is begging you. No, I'm not talking to all of you. I was rebuking someone. That's all. Because none of us is going to enter together 
that he, you will not enter together with second or with any of your children, not the favorite one. Everyone will enter alone. So the promptings of God, follow them. If he says to you, that's your own, lift up your hands, then lift it. If it's not, just continue doing what you are doing. Every man will come at his time. Do you understand that? That's, that's the school we came to open here. It's a school of tyrannos. Where you match charisma, the charisma gifts with character. Because character is the real ministry. The character you develop is what becomes your personality. Personality is the majesty of a river. You know, when you hear the word majesty, what's majesty? Have you seen a river flowing like gentle? But when you drop anything, pop, you see it on the other side. Then you know how swift it is. That's majesty. It's personality. You know, I tell my children they have it by birth. I told my son, stop, stop struggling. I told, stop struggling. What's flying? By birth. Look at your children. See the oil. You don't wait until they manifest it. See it. I gave birth to you. I am the bottle of oil. You are a son of oil. Period. Whenever my children have a problem, I like it when people come and they try to make me feel that something is wrong. I'm asking, what is wrong with who? My son. It's not about me. Except there is no God seated on the throne. Except his order cannot be known. In fact, today he told me, one of the things I'm going to teach you about is PowerPoints. Apart from prosperity. I'm going to teach you the PowerPoints of the kingdom. There are points. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's a PowerPoint. You can never provoke the kingdom until you obey those rules. It's like the law of gravity. There are laws that govern the earth. There are power laws that govern the kingdom of God. When you come to the house of a great man and they set a table before you, put a knife in your throat. Those are principles, laws, governing authorities. They are spirits. Have you read the Chronicles? Where they wanted to tell Ahab to go and die. They asked Micaiah. Micaiah said, I saw God seated upon a throne, isn't it? He said, and I saw the spirits gathered. What are spirits? Are they angels? You think it's only angels that are in heaven? Spirits! <laughs> and they asked them, who can go and deceive Ahab to go and die today on Gilboa? One spirit came. They say, how will you do it? They say, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets, the false prophets, and they will deceive him. The Lord said, go, you prosper. Because Ahab had given himself to listening to lying spirits. I commanded all open wounds to lock up. Yeah. If you were not there, receive it. No open wound. Nonsense. Do you understand that? Nothing, no growth remains in your system. I said, no growth. Not here. Not ever. When you enter, they begin to run. Just your presence. You are not even aware of them. Do you understand that? Every mind that is disordered, receive correction, yes. realignment, yes. reordering. Yes. Friends, there are different kinds of inheritances you can get. I mean, harvest you can get. I told you, if you sow, you will what? So if you don't sow, you will not. That's a shallow level. 
How many of you feel if that's the only way that you'll be eating, that means you would have died of hunger? I feel like that because I don't sow adequately. So my harvest can never be bountiful. So God left a second one, inheritance. Joel is my son. No matter how poorly I die, he will have something to carry. He doesn't have to labor for it. Because it is what? Inheritance. That's how everything Jesus won is yours. By right. Because of association. Of birth. And there is a third higher level. Prophecy. That's why he says, say to the righteous, it is well on Monday, on Tuesday, in January, in March, in December. You are doing what? Prophesying. The moment you say it, heaven does it for Zainab, does it for PDP, does it for Uzo, does it. Do you understand me? Heaven does it because you said it. He didn't say, say to the righteous once. Every time you meet the righteous, what do you say? It is well. I said, what do you say? Yeah. Prophecy. You can deconstruct a past and re-put together a future and give it to a person. She now I see green fields, spring fields, new sprouts. I hear rivers gargling. I hear them cascading. Little fish turn into bigger fish. And I see them flow into the sea. I see rivers. And I see boats of fishermen hanging their nets beside the willows. And I'm describing you. And it will come to pass. Whether you say amen or not. Because it is prophecy. It is prophecy. So one of the laws of the spirit is to circumcise your mouth, your tongue. Because why should you speak nonsense when you can simply prophesy into every life? Somebody slaps you, say the Lord bless you, <laughs> and you walk away, and he thinks you're a buffoon. See, the people that are in the jungle are coming to take your place. Those Boko Haram, they are coming to take your place. Because you are doing nothing. You are turning Jesus into a supplier of prayer requests. Oh Lord, how many years should I be telling you I want to marry? Did Adam tell God he wanted to marry? Who told Adam about wife? Did Adam know there was woman? Did he ever see woman? You anything that passes you suddenly, hey, my God, that is it. Oh Lord, Jesus. Then another thing passed. Hey, oh Lord. Ah, help me. Oh. At least if I settle with one of them, it will save me. It will never save you. As you take her home, you will still be on the street. Some sex doesn't solve the problem of lust. And I'm even talking elementally because once you enter those realms, the revelation stops. Satan terminates our progress into the spirit realm. And I'm, I'm talking spirit today. I'm showing you the roots of this house. So you'll understand why we ordained people the way we did. I didn't orchestrate Chintok coming to town. God knows. I was out of the city. I was already traveling. Then the journey didn't work. Even this week, I should have left. It was yesterday, one of the embassies called me that I'm supposed to come for an uh, interview on Tuesday. So even if I traveled, I would have missed it. And it's so complex getting interview dates. Because when I came and I realized that I wasn't traveling, then I was talking to them. Then I saw Francis's handbill. And I saw that Chintok was coming. So I called him and I said, is he really coming? He said, yes. And honestly, I just jokingly said, I've been to Samson's meeting. I've not been to Francis' meeting. So I didn't want him to start feeling like I prefer Pastor Samson. And even at that, the night before, I told him and Samson categorically, I'm not coming. I didn't feel like it. I was not strong. I wanted to sleep. I traveled too many times back and forth, Abuja. 
too many times. And then I went there and Dado was there. And immediately after the meeting, I said, hey, Dado, you are there? I said, so where is Sarah? He said, she didn't come. I said, when are you going back? He said, first thing tomorrow, sir. I'm taking the first flight to Lagos. So I said, oh, Ukwari. I was going to say, maybe you will preach. But mommy is preaching anyway. Because I asked her and she told me she would preach. I said, I praise God. No plans whatsoever. Just the wind of the spirit. Can you believe God to bring your appointments and to weed out your disappointment? I'm talking about people. It's people that are appointments. It is people that are disappointments. Can you believe God? Tell him, take away any man I don't need to meet and bring in my appointments. Appointments are people. <laughs> there was a time one man, one man was looking for me. I think he came to this to our offices maybe more than seven times and to the house. God knows. I am leaving and he is coming. Or he is leaving and I am arriving. And I told everybody plainly, my wife, everybody, I said, we're not supposed to meet. We're not in the same keda of ministry. I'm not the kind that he can take for granted and survive. So I don't want to meet him so that he can be speared. Abigail told David now, go back, sheath your sword. God will fight for you. She was not saying God will fight. She was saying God has already fought. Ten days later, Nabal was dead. I look unassuming. If you meet us with my wife, we fight so many times that you, are, you think we are not in the spirit. <laughs> yeah. So you can take us for granted. That's the truth. But I like ordinary people who carry the supernatural. I love them. It's a better packaging. That's how Jesus was. 